everybody. Today I'm going to be reading the 12th chapter of the Enola Holmes mystery, The Case of the Missing Marquess. Chapter the 12th. But, but that was absurd. Impossible. He was supposed to be running away to sea. Quite without any proper introduction, I exclaimed, What in heaven's names are you doing here? He arched his golden brows. You presume an acquaintance, miss? For mercy's sake, I presume nothing. Integration and surprise spurred me to sit up straight. Not without difficulty and ill temper. I know who you are, Twerky. Tukey, don't call me that. Very well, Lord Tuke's bur burial at sea. What are you doing here? Doing barefoot in a boat. One might, with equal justice, ask what a snip of a girl is doing all gadded up as a, as a willow. Sharpening his tone grew ever more as estrotic. Oh, I shot back. A cabin boy with an Eton, with an Eton ac accent? Oh, a widow with no wedding ring? Not being able to see my hands bound behind my back, I hadn't realized. But now, propped up by my bustle, working my fingers against the cords that bound my wrist, I exclaimed, What did he take my gloves for? They corrected his, lord his lordship, the viscount, plural, two of them. They wanted to steal your ring and found none. Despite his arrogant lecturing air, I could see how when his ashen face could see his lips tremble as they spoke. They went through your pockets also, finding a few shillings, hairpins, three licorice sticks, and a rather filthy handkerchief. Indeed, I tried to quell this ratification for the thought that while I was unconscious, strange men had put their hands into my pockets the very idea made me shudder. Thankfully, they had not actually touched my person, for my improvised wearable baggage remained where it belonged. I could feel bust enhancer hip regulators and dress improver occupying their positions, a comb, a hairbrush, a, a flowery little booklet of some sort. My heart pinged as if he had just killed my mother before my eyes. My eyes burned, but I had to bite my lip. For this was neither the time nor the place to mourn my loss. And as one side of your dress is sliced wide open, a glimpse of that scandalous pink corset you're wearing. Nasty boy. My, mi my misery fueled anger, hot with embarrassment and quivering with fury. I flared at him. You deserve to be right where you are, bound hand and foot. How d and how do you, dear girl, no older than I am, deserve the same? I am older. How much older? I told him before. I remembered I must reveal my age to no one. Confound him. He was clever. And despite his bravo, f frightened. As frightened as I was. After deepen, after taking a, teep, a deep breath, I asked him softly, How long have you been here? Only an hour or so. While the little one was snatching me, it seemed the big one was following you for some reason. I. He broke off. As heavy footsteps sounded overhead, they halted, a square lantern light opened at the far end of our prison, and I found myself watching the ra rather ludicrous sight of a man appearing from the back of the bottom-up rubber boots first, as he dis descended into our den by a ladder. No more than an hour ago, he said to someone up above as he climbed down. I recognized his squeaky voice. Skinny, stunted, bent, this man cowered like a much-kicked and undeferred mongrel. Found him right where you told me. You and your were wire mooching about the docks and where they be the great eastern. We know what to do with him, but what about the girl? Much the same. Growled the other man's voice as he descended in his turn. I knew that voice too, and watched statically as black booted feet were followed by hulking limbs of clad in dark clothing that might once have belonged to a gentleman. Although now gone to steed, his pale kid gloves I could see in the light of the lantern bore he wore were yellow. Many gentry men and ladies alike wore kid gloves, often yellow serving to advertise a certain social class. When the back of a massive man's head came into view, however, I saw that he wore not a gentleman's hat, but the cloth 
cap of a laborer. I was prepared then. When he turned around I saw his, and I saw his face, it was indeed the cold white face that had appeared like a baleful moon into my railway car compartment or a baleful white skull. As he removed his cap, I saw that he was quite bald, disgustingly so, like a maggot, except for bristles of wiry, wiry, reddish hair protruding from his ears. I thought you were only after, you were only after, only in case I missed ye mark, I missed me mark, said the other. To doubtfully sure, yes. The drawled big, the drawled, drawled the big, the bald, the big bald one. But also because she says her name is Holmes. As he spoke to his companion, he watched my face with meticulous enjoyment, smirking as my eyes flew open and my jaw dropped. How could I not help showing my so my shock? For how did he know who I was? How could he possibly know? Satisfied by my reaction, he turned back to his companion. She says she's related to Sherlock Holmes. If that is true, there is swag to be got for her. Why you try to kill her then? So this bulky man with the hair in his ears was, as I had surmised, the cutthroat who had attacked me. He shrugged his burly shoulders. She vexed me, he said, with chill indifference. I managed to close my gaping mouth as things began to make sense. He had been looking for me on the train. He had followed me from the station. Yet, yet nothing made sense. Why accosting me? Had he thought I knew where Lord Tewkesbury was? Shrew. The cutthroat looked back straight at me with eyes like black eyes, something I could not think what familiar about that glare. Although... I'll not deny it scared me so badly that I shook. He told me, Girls hereabouts mostly don't have sh the shillings for corsets. I've sliced a few bellies wide open in my time. Don't cross me again. I sat silent, unable to think of any suitable reply. In truth, frightened witless. But then, the other man, the rickety one, spoilt the effect by saying to his companion, Well, you better watch yourself and don't make Sherlock Holmes vexed either. I won't hear you. You don't fool with the other with that gent. The big one turned on him. I fool with whomever I please. His tone menaced, menaced like a knife blade. I'm going to sleep. You guard these two. My in, that, were, that were my intention anyway, the other muttered. But only after hulking the brute... After the hulking brute had disappeared back up the ladder, the skinny one, the Mongol watchdog, settled himself with his back against the ladder, stared at us with vicious little eyes. I demanded of him, Who are you? Even in the dim light of the oil lamp, I could see his yellow grin lacked several teeth. Prince Charma, D. Horseapple, at your service, he told me. What an obvious falsehood, I scowled at him. While we're doing introductions, said Lord Tewkesbury to me. I pray tell. What is your name? I shook my head at him. No talking. Squeaky voice said. What? I asked him coldly. Do you and your friend intend to do with us? Take you dancing, dearies. I told you no talking. Unwillingly to assume this re re -preach Reprinciable person any longer. I lay down sideway on the bare planks with my cut portion of my dress beneath me. I closed my eyes. It is difficult to sleep or even pretend to sleep with one's hands tied behind. To make matters worse, the tip of my steel corset ribs jabbed me painfully under the arms. My thoughts as well as my body were far from comfortable. The mention of swag indicated money, leading me to conclude that I was being held for ransom. I could not imagine a more humili humiliating way to be returned to my brothers, who would have no doubt then to send me off to boarding school with a spanking. I wondered whether they would take my money away. I wondered how, how, how the big ruffian had learned of me to follow me, and even more appalling, had learned of Viscount 
Viscount Tewksbury and wired his monogram like accomplice about him. I wondered much the same meant. Quavering with terror, I urged myself to be alert for any chance I had to escape. Yet at the same time, I knew I would be wise to breathe more calmly, stop trembling, muster my energy, try to sleep. Because the shape of the boat's hull, I lay at an incline, somewhat hammock-shaped but far from restful. Even with all the padding I wore, shifting my limbs, I tried for a less cramped position. Without success, because of the steel ribs of my confounded corset, now only tormented my arms, but at the other end they poked through the rent in my dress, reminding me all too plainly of how that cutthroat's knife had. Steel. Knife. I lay very still, oh, if only I could do it. At a moment's thought, I opened my eyes just enough to pay peek at Squeaky the watchdog through my eyelashes. How fortunate that my modesty had made me lie upon my right side facing him in order to conceal my corset. He sat with his back against the ladder but his head lolling, asleep, and why not for how long he, as he remained in position by the ladder? How could we possibly get past him? But I would have to deal with that po problem later. As silently as I could, I turned the upper portion of my person, trying to bound, to place my bound wrist against a, pro a protruding rib of my corset. It was not easy as the slash in my dress was at the side, but by straining one arm to the utmost while propping myself up on the elbow of the other, clenching my teeth from, to keep from making a sound, I contrived to loop the cord that bound my wrist around the tip of the steel corset stay. So I twisted that I so twisted that I could barely move, nevertheless I managed to force back the heavily stretched fabric that sheathed the steel. Even then more controlled I began trying to cut through the cords. Not once did I look at Lord Tewksbury, trying to think of him as little as possible. And then only tried to assure myself that he must be asleep, otherwise I must I would have felt mortification of my posture beyond bearing. Back and forth, back and forth, with great difficulty difficulty dif difficult I can't speak. With great difficulty I sought a way with my hands and arms while pressing my bound wrists against the steel painfully. And for quite a long time, I cannot say how many foul hours ensued, for there was no telling night from day in that hole. There was no telling either whether I was making any progress against the cords, for I could not see what I was doing. I could feel what I was cutting, feel that I was cutting myself, but I clenched my jaw and bore down all the harder, my gaze fixed on the sleeping guard, my ears straining to be here beyond my own panting breath, I felt more more than heard the lapping of the waves, the sloshing, the slopping of village water, the occasional muffled bump as the boat drifted against its pier, squeaky to twitched as if pestered by a flea. I had just the time to flap myself, hands hit him from behind his view, before he opened his eyes. Seer, he complained, glaring at me. What you're rocking the bloody boat for. End of chapter 12.